evening. Good evening, everybody. Whether you're around the corner or if you're tuning in from around the world, we thank God and praise God for this day, this 29th day of the eighth month of the 23rd year of the third decade of this century and third millennium. We give God glory for another Tuesday of study in God's word. Tonight, we will take our stand in Matthew chapter 16. We will read selected passages from this epic chapter, and I pray that it will benefit you greatly. We're going to open with prayer and then I have a song that I'd like to play to set the mood for the evening. I think that it will help us tremendously. So, as a matter of fact, why don't we play the song now? Then I'll pray and we'll go into the study. I want you to listen to Brother Lee Williams of Sainted Memory now. Jesus will fix it. Cue it up. And we'll start it right now. Gets me proud I live with that in my head. But that's all right. Because I know G. I am proud. I'm in my way. I've got to cry sometimes. So much real. Gets me proud sometimes. I lay awake at night, but that's all right, cause I know Jesus, after a let me say it again, trouble, after a while sometimes, I've got trouble, it makes me cry sometimes. I lay awake at night, but that's all right, cause I know Jesus, 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 I know you will, I wonder, I just wonder, is there anybody here? That no he will. I need somebody that no he will. Anybody here that no God will. Talking about a doctor in a cell room. A company keeper in a lonely hour. Standing 
God, my God, my God, let us pray. Jesus, you will fix it. Whatever it is, you will fix it. We thank you, God, for this word of encouragement through song. We thank you, God, for setting the table for your study tonight. We thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And we ask you to illumine our way through your word. Touch someone, encourage someone, heal someone, help someone, lift someone. Do your work, have your way. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just felt a little churchy <laughs> and I thought that I would share that song to set the stage for our study tonight. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to read a few verses, uh, at least 20 verses. We're going to start with verse one and uh, we will read uh, through verse 20. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Word. Your version may read a bit differently, but we are depending on the Holy Spirit of God to help us arrive at the same point of understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. The Pharisees and Sadducees came. And to test Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They said to one another, is it because we have brought no bread? And becoming aware of it, Jesus said, you of little faith, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you not perceive? Do you not remember 
the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How could you fail to perceive that I was not speaking about bread? Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees when they understood that he told them not to be aware or told them to be aware of the yeast, but teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, when Jesus came, and excuse me, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some said, or some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly warned or ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We needed to read a few verses tonight to provide context for the teaching of this lesson. I certainly thank Minister Kamari McHenry for the outstanding word that we received Sunday. And had it been my turn to preach, this passage would have been a part of the sermonic preparation for last Sunday. Jesus is hoping to glean from the disciples a confession of faith. Not one that he would manipulate, but one that would sincerely flow from their bellies, their mouths. He wanted to sure up uh, his relationship with them as they moved forward into the future together. A future that would involve an ultimate sacrifice and a transformation of life. So before he has this moment with them in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus has an encounter with Sadducees and Pharisees who are threatened by his ministry. Keeping in mind that Jesus does not have the credentials that these religious leaders have. That he was not born into intergenerational privilege that Jesus was not from the tribe of Levi, the 
tribe that produced the priests and the leaders of Judaism at that time. Jesus did not walk around uh, in privilege. He did not walk around in fine garments. He did not have uh, gold chains hanging from his neck with uh, jewel encrusted boxes, little boxes that contained uh, the scrolls of the law. He did not have those trappings while the people around him were suffering. He was really of the people and of heaven. <laughs> but the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, wanted to entrap him because they did not understand him. And that certainly is being generous. They did not trust him because they believed that he was going to turn uh, the multitudes against them, which would have certainly uh, not only threatened their status, but which would have eliminated their relevance such as it was and would have fomented what would have amounted to a revolution that uh, the Roman Empire would have to quell, thus stamping out Judaism. You know, fear is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And everything that they were afraid of actually came to pass. But that's another uh, lesson for another time. But this is one of the reasons why you and I cannot operate in fear and in insecurity. Because if we do, uh, we will reap what we sow. <laughs> so Jesus says that uh, you are adept, he said to uh, his opposition. You're adept at uh, telling and forecasting the weather. You know that when the sky is red in the evening, uh, that uh, that red sky will give way to a warm and uneventful and sunny day. But if the sky is red in the morning, you know that is a sky of foreboding that it will give way to storm and rain. Uh, I learned this little adage when I was a boy, when I first started uh, fishing. I knew that uh, red sky in the morning was a sailor's warning. Red sky at night was a sailor's delight. And I dare you to pay attention to the sky. Uh, it will not fool you. If the sky uh, is red, even if the sun rises, if the sky is red in the morning, uh, it usually gives indication that redness in the sky, uh, that there may be uh, a storm on the horizon. And if you get a beautiful sunset with red hues, uh, the next day uh, will be fair. Um, it works. <laughs> it certainly does. Jesus says, you have the ability to, to see uh, through a meteorological lens what the weather will be, but you can't see the signs of the time. And uh, that leaves you spiritually blind. And the only sign he says you will see from me is the sign of Jonah, which was the sign of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Keep in mind, in the book of Jonah, 
Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights before the fish spit him up <laughs> and he came out of the belly or the tomb, if you will, the grave, if you will, of that great fish that we call a whale. And then Jonah was released to finish the mission that God gave him. That was indeed a sign of resurrection. And Jesus says that would be the sign that he would provide those who did not believe that he was sent from God. So when the disciples and Jesus catch up with each other, the disciples have forgotten, had forgotten to bring provisions. And uh, they were kind of uh, kicking each other over it. You know, they had to travel. They had to um, get where they were going and they didn't have food. They forgot to bring bread. And uh, Jesus said, uh, beware of the leaven, the bread, the yeast that causes the bread to rise of the Pharisees and Sadducees. This was an impressive group of people. Uh, they looked holy. Um, they sounded very uh, seriously religious. Paul might say of the lot that they had the form of godliness, but the, denied the power thereof. You know, there are a lot of people that look holy, <laughs> but there's not much to them. And uh, sometimes we uh, are intimidated by them because they know a scripture or two or they sound uh, like they are authorities and what they say goes. They uh, purport to be oracles or the voice, the voices of God. And uh, for those of us, this is why we study the Bible, so that we can study to show ourselves approved unto God, workers that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We shouldn't allow people to push and bully us uh, over scripture. We ought to know that scripture, that the word of God yields life. And this is why we study so that we can have a firm footing. And this is not to put anybody else down, but we, as the old folks used to say, we need to know God for ourselves. We need to know the word of God for ourselves. We need to rightly divide it or interpret it. And then that way we won't be uh, caught up and tossed and driven by every wind and doctrine. <laughs> uh, and and uh, our four parents in the faith did not have the advantage that you and I have. Uh, even these uh, men, that are the focus of this particular lesson, they did not have the advantage. We don't know how many of these uh, disciples were literate. We know that the vast majority of the people of Jesus' day could not read or write. And the Pharisees and Sadducees were not interested in them gaining an education. This is why we have to be careful in our current context of those who want to dismantle public education and only make education available and affordable to a select few. Because if the masses of people can uh, be made ignorant because they can't read and if they are given propaganda on a 24 hour news cycle and told a certain lie and the lie just continues to reverberate until it appears to be the truth, that group of people can be led to hell. 
<laughs> they can be led off a cliff. They can be led into authoritarianism. They can accept oligarchy. I wish you hear me. You and I need, listen, education is vital. Education is, is next to salvation. Education is liberating. And that doesn't mean that you have to go to a four-year institution, but you need to know how to read. <laughs> yes, indeed. You, you need to know how to write. You, you need to know how to speak. Uh, you need to know for yourself uh, these truths that you hold self-evident. That all are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We need to know that. We need to know that whom the sun sets free is free indeed. We need to know that. We need to know that there are not alternative facts and alternative truths. No, there is a truth. <laughs> Gardner C. Taylor said that the only way a lie can live is to attach itself to the truth. And we need to have the discernment to distinguish between a lie and the truth. And this is what Jesus was telling the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, telling the disciples about the Pharisees and Sadducees. They, they, had, they had their version, but their version was not connected to the Holy Ghost. There was no life, no power, no liberation, uh, no bondage breaking, no, no shackle uh, destroying and yoke destroying in it. So Jesus said, you know, I couldn't have been talking about bread. And why are you worried about bread anyway in the natural? You're with the bread. I am the bread of life. Don't you remember the 5,000 that we fed and had uh, food left over? Don't you remember the 4,000 that we fed? And, and it is the case that you and I sometimes get caught up in the moment and we forget. Don't we forget? We forget how God is a way maker. We forget that God is a door opener. We forget that, that God uh, feeds us and, and, and takes care of us and heals us because we get caught up in the moment of a situation or a circumstance and it caught for whatever reason we forget what God has already done. And in the words of Ty Tribbett, if God did it before, God will do it again. And that's really based on the word of God. Not just taking Ty Tribbett's word for it. He's confessing scripture when he says if God has done it before, God will do it again. I'm encouraging myself as I'm encouraging you. Don't forget the goodness of the Lord. Next time you run into something, the next time you're up against something, the next time your back is up against the wall, just pause and remember how God got you out of your last jam. <laughs> How God made a way out of nowhere. This is what Jesus was telling the disciples. Yes, you may have forgotten the, the bread, but you're with the bread. But I want you to be concerned about the, the, the false bread that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are offering you. I know somebody wants to say amen. <laughs> I know you're feeling this. So, so Jesus uh, takes 
the disciples to Caesarea Philippi. And uh, he conducts uh, what amounts to be an opinion poll. And you know, uh, sometimes uh, uh, you get a poll and you don't like uh, hearing the results of the survey, but uh, it's still important to hear it. Uh, maybe it's not relevant, I don't know. Maybe it is rooted and grounded in reality but you can face the facts and not lose the faith. So uh, Jesus was not afraid. His ego was not bruised uh, by what the disciples, or his ego was not threatened by what the disciples might have conveyed to him when he uh, surveyed them on what people were saying about him. So Jesus plainly asks, what are people saying about me? <laughs> and uh, the disciples had their ear to the ground. You know, uh, they obviously weren't with Jesus 24-7. Uh, you know, they had to run errands and mix and mingle and, and uh, catch up with family when they had opportunity. I mean, the disciples and Jesus didn't live in a convent. They, <laughs> they, they, were, they were not sequestered from the world. And, uh, you know, Jesus sometimes got away from them and they got away from Jesus and they got out and about. And, and uh, the Bible uh, clearly states these things. So when Jesus asks them, they tell him, well, some think that you are Elijah. Some, some think that uh, you are Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. You know, Elijah uh, was a prophet of old who did not taste death. Uh, he was taken up in a whirlwind, if you will, or a chariot of fire from earth to heaven, according to the story. And uh, that was a high compliment to be compared to Elijah because Elijah was uh, the one of expectation. He was the one that uh, the Jewish people were expecting to return uh, when uh, time was uh, fulfilled, when history uh, was uh, finally consummated and eternity would begin. So uh, that was a good that was a good thing. I mean, all of the reports uh, were good. You know, Jesus was compared to one of the prophets, uh, other prophets, other leaders. And uh, in the words of Dr. Sandy Ray, uh, Jesus realized that uh, the disciples' loyalties were still divided. Uh, they. Uh, you know, they were adherents of, of Moses and, and they believed in Elijah. And now Jesus comes along. Now Jesus has done some impressive things and important things, but uh, uh, they were not wholly convinced uh, to throw away uh, 4,000 years of, of teaching and tradition and religion uh, merely to elevate Jesus uh, to be the Messiah. They were still struggling with that. Uh, just as you and I, on occasion, still struggle with the place that Jesus holds. I mean, some of us see Jesus uh, as the Son of God, but we wrestle with the whole idea of Jesus being God. <laughs> Don't we? And uh, so we express our theology, our Christology concerning Jesus. And uh, we hold fast to it because it's hard for us to conceive that, uh, that Jesus is God. Some of us embrace it and some of us still wrestle with it. But uh, what we don't understand today, trust me, we'll understand better by and by, just stay close.
<laughs> if you stay close to the fire, you will be warmed. So we don't have to get into a food fight. But I just want you to know that that our our struggle with Jesus place uh, in time and in eternity uh, has antecedents. There are other people uh, that wrestled with this whole idea of Jesus uh, before you and I showed up. So our wrestling uh, is not novel. <laughs> help me, help, help me teach Holy Ghost. Um, and this may be one of the reasons why uh, the, the whole idea of the Trinity has come into being. And, and there is, you know, uh, consternation in some Christian camps over the Trinity. Some people just don't buy it. They don't believe it because they think that uh, we have made three gods. <laughs> and, and, and that's another discussion for another time. But, but do you understand uh, that, that you can be on this road and still have questions? And there's nothing wrong with that. That means that you're alive, that you're alert, uh, that you want to know truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So I, I encourage you to stay in the struggle. You'll get it. I'll get it. We'll get it. If we just hang in and hold on, God will reveal it all to us. So then Jesus gets personal and he asks them, well, who do you say I am? You're the ones that have spent the most time with me. I mean, we've been at this thing since uh, we have decided uh, to covenant and work together. Uh, you, we've been at this well over two years. We're in the, the 16th chapter of, of Matthew's gospel. You know, Matthew has 28 chapters. There's still a lot of terrain, probably another year, year and a half that has to be covered before Jesus uh, makes it to Golgotha, the place of the skull that we call Calvary. And, and Peter makes this phenomenal confession. And uh, we'd like to think, I'm certain that Peter would like to think that he came up with this idea. Uh, he says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. That's who you are. You are God in the flesh. You are fully human and fully divine. You're the one that we've been looking for. You are the hope of all of the ages. <laughs> Lord, have mercy, Jesus. That's who you are. And do you think that Peter came up with all of that on his own? I, I believe that, that some of it uh, came uh, to him, but some of it came through him. I mean, God uh, gives us moments of, of inspiration and revelation and uh, things flow through us, a stream of consciousness. You know, William James, one of the uh, great uh, philosophical thinkers of the 19th and 20th century introduced the concept of stream of consciousness. Sometimes we're just vibing and, and we're flowing and the words come out and it appears as though we have tapped into uh, the other parts of our brain that have not been used. Because the human being, uh, the average human <clears throat> only uses about 10% of the brain's capacity. And, uh, you know, uh, on those occasions when everything is clear, everything is lucid, and we're sure of what we say. It is a phenomenal experience. We are absolutely sure of the truth of God. And that is a kairos, 
uh, a God moment. It is not bound by time and space. <laughs> it is eternal. And uh, if you've not had a stream of consciousness, uh, maybe you've had it and just didn't know it. <laughs> you, you didn't know how to label it. You, you, you did not know how uh, to frame it. But if you have walked with God, uh, you've experienced it. I, I, am abs I am convinced that you have experienced it if you are really walking with God. Peter makes the confession. And Jesus says, you didn't come up with this on your own. Flesh and blood merely did not uh, precipitate your your statement, your declaration, your proclamation. That flowed through you from eternity into time. <laughs> Lord have mercy, Jesus. But he said, then Jesus went on to say, but upon the rock of this truth, and, and, you know, some people have gotten it confused, and it's okay. Uh, we see through a glass darkly. Uh, some people think that, that Peter uh, founded the church. Uh, I'm not here to argue with anybody tonight. Uh, he certainly was one of the uh, uh, charter members. <laughs> But, but, but the church is Jesus's. I wish somebody would help me. So, some, somebody help me. Somebody help me up in here. Yeah, the, the church belongs to Jesus. Yeah, I, I'm careful. Uh, Calvary does not belong to me. And, and, and the people of Calvary are not my people. I am privileged to serve. I have been privileged to serve in a wonderful church for 29 years. And uh, I don't let my colleagues or anybody else uh, give me ownership. I know that sometimes people say that's Foster's church. No, Foster, listen, it, it can't be. First of all, it's 104 years old. <laughs> and I'm not bad. It is not mine naturally, it's not mine spiritually. I'm just grateful to be a steward of the mysteries of God. And, and when my time has come, when my time will come uh, to exit the stage, uh, I pray that things will be left in a little better shape than when I found them and somebody else will carry on but the church belongs to Jesus Christ. If it's going to survive, if it's going, if it's going to last until uh, the return of the Lord Jesus, it must belong to Christ. And that's just the local assembly. That's just what I'm talking about now. But, but, the, but the whole revelation of the church which which does not have borders, does not have walls, does not have a membership roster, does not have an operating book budget and all of that other kind. I'm not talking about the institutional church. I'm talking about the organic church. Listen, that church will withstand the test of time. I wish you would hear me tonight. Before uh, all is said and done, we don't know what we'll have to go through. We don't, we don't know what geopolitical experiences we'll have. We, you know, the church has had to go underground before in its history. Uh, the church has had to live in catacombs. It's had to live in caves. It had to go undercover uh, even in, in uh, Germany during World War II. There was uh, a pretend church, but the real church uh, the church militant had to go underground. 
and uh, the church is alive. I don't care where the authority, I don't care what authoritarian government is reigning and ruling in these countries around the world, uh, whether it's in China, whether it's in the Soviet Union, the real church is yet alive. It, it may not be visible uh, to, to many because of persecution and, and, and all kinds of, of, of opposition but, but the organic church uh, is alive. And Jesus says that upon the rock of the truth that, that Peter confessed through the power of the Holy Ghost, that church will continue to live and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Thank you, Jesus. You, you understand what I'm saying? Some of you uh, who, who love going to church, but circumstances uh, don't allow you to come to church. Not, I'm not talking about just because you're scared of the pandemic. I'm not talking about because you're slowful and lazy, but, but there are sometimes, I mean, there are people that are confined you know, uh, to beds of affliction. There are people that are institutionalized uh, they're behind prison bars. There, there are circumstances and situations that, that prevent people from coming to church, to the church house, but they are still the church. They still pray and God still hears them. They still read scripture and they're inspired by it. They still have a song on their lips and in their spirits and they make melody. <laughs> they have songs that the angels can't sing. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. And if you and I live long enough, that may wind up being the church of our reality. God will be there. God, God, God will come into any context. God will come into any situation and God will reveal God's self to us. So it's not the building that will prevail against the gates of hell. It is the church in us. Somebody ought to help me say something. <laughs> Oh, this is good tonight. And then Jesus goes on and, and he, he shares power. Even though he has all power, he shares it. And he says to his followers, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Hallelujah. I'll give you binding and loosing power so that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed, released in heaven. And I, I'm not quite sure that, that we understand the kind of power that Jesus has given us. You know, it's a wonderful thing uh, when you uh, close on a mortgage and uh, you get uh, the deed to the house, uh, you get some keys. Uh, uh, when you sign the lease, you get keys to your apartment or, or your other place of, of, of abode, of dwelling. Some of us are privileged to have keys to our workplaces and spaces. And we have codes. And that conveys a trust. And uh, it, it, it's, it's special and we should never take those things for granted. But the keys that God has for us are greater than any earthly keys that we'll ever amass. We have keys to the kingdom of heaven, <laughs> to the realm of God, to the throne of grace. We don't have to feel weak and helpless 
because we can speak things that are not as though they were. It's what the word of God tells us in Romans chapter four. We can do it. We have power to say to the storm, peace be still. We have power to quell the madness and the violence. We, we, can, we can make the enemy go somewhere and leave us alone for a season. If Jesus could do it, we can do it because we've got the keys. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. We, somebody know, knows what I'm talking about because you have used the keys. Anybody use the keys? <laughs> Has anybody unlocked some doors in Jesus' name? Thank you, God. I'm just going to let things sit right there. And uh, I'm going to pick up Sunday morning where we left off tonight, okay? Okay. <clears throat> I thank God for Jesus. Anybody thank God for Jesus? That, that's why I've become less frustrated. I've become less worried about things. I'm not delusional. I, I know that uh, the enemy uh, is, is, is running amok. But God has all power. And God knows how to make the enemy our footstool. David said it like this, when my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they tripped, stumbled, and fell. Though a host encamp against me, in this will I be confident. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have confidence because we have the keys. You know, there's talk about revolution and there's talk about this and talk about that and talk, uh, talk about all of these uh, sick uh, and deranged people who have weapons. I want to let you know that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It's heartbreaking to see any of our people uh, become the victims of hateful gun violence. We mourn with the city of Jacksonville. But, but this hatred, it's going to come to an end. <clears throat> Just as sure as Pharaoh's army was drowned in the Red Sea. <laughs> it's got to behave. And we need not be afraid. Jesus has already told us, don't be afraid of the one who can kill the body. Be afraid and be fearful of the one who can take body and soul. Nobody can take our souls. And if our ancestors made through what they went through, we can handle this moment and victory will be ours. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this lesson tonight. We thank you, God, for the confession of faith. We thank you, God, for teaching us how to be wary and watchful. of those who pretend to represent you and know you. 
but their deeds are far from you. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to study, to show ourselves approved unto you. So that we can be unashamed workers, rightly dividing the word of truth. We thank you for speaking to us and through us. We thank you for the power sharing of heaven. Your order, your will, your way, your realm. your kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. Bless us, God. Hear us, heal us, help us, deliver us. Stir in us your supernatural power. Help us not to be ashamed and help us not to be afraid. Cover and protect your people in Florida tonight as they're facing hurricane winds once again. in the natural and then bless God, those who are being buffeted by the winds of hate and violence. You're a rock in the weary land and you're a shelter in the time of storm. You serve notice and you'll do it again to everyone who pretends to be you. They are not you. And we thank you for that. Help everybody find their voice. Help everybody find their place. Do it for your glory. Give us fresh courage for the living of these days. We love you and we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Praise God and thank God. Yes, 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 yes. I'm going to give you another song and then I'm going to leave you alone. And that doesn't mean that you'll be lonely. It just means that you'll have space and place <clears throat> for the rest of the evening to meditate on the goodness of God. And I pray that you will and I pray that all will be well with you. Here's another blast from the past. I want you to listen to the Williams brothers. I'm just feeling a little old school tonight, so forgive me. I'm just a nobody. Listen.
walking downtown one day, and I saw a man who appeared to be just an old wild man, sitting on the street, telling the people about Jesus as they passed by. And because he was all raggedy and dirty, people would just laugh and make fun of the old man and walk on by. And he said, because of the way I am, no money, no fancy clothes, fine homes and cars, a lot of people consider me as nothing and say I don't know what I'm talking about. But there's one thing that he said that really touched my heart and stayed on my mind. When that old man looked up and said, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. My God. He said, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Anybody remember this one? I had so many problems in my life that I just couldn't deal with. So I started drinking, thought it would help ease my pain. But things got worse. So I said, Lord, I give up. I'm in your hands. And that's when my life began to change. But these people think I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody About somebody Who can save anybody My God I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody About somebody Who can save anybody and he said, on the streets day and night, that's my life, that's my home. Ain't got nowhere else I can go. So I just walk the streets, telling the people about Jesus. From corner to corner, from door to door. But they all make fun of me and say, I'm a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. My, my, my. Oh, just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Tell your people, say. Say. The Lord say, Ooh, we can save the evil soul. Hallelujah. I tell you, through Jesus Christ, your life can be changed and made whole. He can bring everlasting joy and peace within your soul. Ooh, can you and in many ways, I feel like an old man, born in the country, raised on the farm, no money, no plastic clothes, no fine homes and cars. But thank God, mom and daddy raised me up on the real deal. And that's God Almighty. And sometimes when I sing about Jesus, and people won't listen, I feel like I'm just a nobody. Well, <clears throat> I'm through. <laughs> May not be finished, but I'm through for tonight. And I pray that you have been blessed by the study of the word of God tonight. Be encouraged. The best is yet to come. 
Join the conference call line on Thursday night for the fellowship hour starting at 7 o'clock U.S. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Join the prayer line Friday. Conference call line, 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. I know we're heading into a holiday weekend, the Labor Day weekend, but we're going to be open for business Sunday morning in person. And we certainly had a wonderful, wonderful turnout last Sunday as we praise God outside and broke bread together. It was just beautiful. But we will be inside uh, the sanctuary Sunday, uh, 10 o'clock U.S. Eastern Time, and we will be connected to our virtual platforms as well. Want you to be blessed. Want you to keep the faith. Want you to continue to believe and trust God. Love you and God bless you. <laughs>